Hi, this is Chris Hodges with JobsLikeUs.com. Today we're here with Michael George. He works in electrical engineering with NXP. So we're going to talk to him about what he does every day on a daily basis. Good to be with you guys today. Uh, as Chris said, uh, my name is Michael George and uh, electrical engineer with uh, NXP Semiconductors uh, located out of Austin, Texas. Glad to be with you today and uh, look forward to the conversation. So Michael, would you like to share how you got into electrical engineering, kind of what your career path, how it migrated to where it is today, where you started, kind of what your thoughts were when you even got started? Yeah, it was, it was really kind of interesting even, uh, you know, as I look back uh, in high school, I knew I wanted to do something in the math and sciences area just because that was my strong suit of where I was headed. Uh, but as I got closer to my senior year, wasn't really landing any uh, really funding for college. And so at the time when I was a senior, I was thinking, hey, I may have to just go into the military for a little bit and uh, do something along that lines before I could actually go to college. Uh, and really fortunate enough, right before uh, I graduated, I did get an opportunity to go uh, for University of Texas at Dallas. And at that particular point, uh, the scholarship was uh, really just in the broad field of engineering. They were, they were just opening up their campus uh, for undergraduates at the time. Uh, I knew that kind of clicked with me just because it was more math and science type based. And uh, so I ended up taking a chance and just said, hey, I, I didn't know a lot of engineers at the time myself. Uh, nobody in my family had done any engineering. I kind of knew generally kind of what it was about sounded interesting, kind of exciting, very diverse type of a field. And of course, uh, where I was coming from it was out of the Dallas area. So there's big companies there that everybody knew about, Texas Instruments, uh, various other companies like Nortel Networks at the time. Cisco, of course, was really big up there. So all of these big, big, huge engineering firms that you heard about. And I thought, man, it would be so cool to work for one of those companies, even though I, at the time as a senior in high school, really didn't fully grasp exactly what they were doing. Just knew it was in the high tech industry, high tech field. A lot of things were happening in that area of, of, the, of the industry. So that's kind of what kind of drew my interest. And then really, uh, as I got into college, uh, still, even the first couple of years, I wasn't exactly sure where I wanted to specialize in. I was just taking kind of broad engineering, and then eventually, uh, as I got into junior year, uh, I had to make a, dis a decision about where I wanted to head. And of course, uh, engineering is very diverse. You've got various different disciplines, computer engineering, uh, you know, architectural engineering, mechanical, thermal. Uh, electrical communications all these variety of degrees and felt a little overwhelmed at the time but uh, finally decided on electrical engineering just because I had heard so many good things in the sense of, of where the industry was headed as a whole and within electrical engineering it's it's very diverse in itself in that uh, you know you probably 15 16 17 different uh, dis disciplines that are within electrical engineering itself but uh, ended up doing electrical, electrical engineering through college and uh, was fortunate enough to get an internship and uh, worked for a company out of the Dallas area, a Digital Switch. And uh, that's really what caught my interest because right when I had that internship, and that's really what I would encourage everyone as you're pursuing your degrees in engineering, those internships are very, very vital. Uh, you definitely want to jump into those and as many of those you can do throughout your college career. Get your feet wet because again, there's many different opportunities within engineering. And for me, what helped solidify it in my mind was really that internship that I had for a couple yeah. semesters working for Digital Switch. And uh, really just uh, that, that caught my interest in the sense that they were doing uh, uh, telecommunications design work at the time, doing board level stuff. Uh, found myself, hey, this is cool, kind of creating things, designing things, mm -hmm. and uh, being under the, uh, the wing of a very experienced engineer who showed me lots of different things. So that's really how I got my interest. I guess I kind of stumbled into it away. It wasn't anything that my parents were pushing me into or anything that I even thought about even as my, I began my high school career. It wasn't something I was wanting to do, but I just kind of stumbled into it. But now looking back, I don't know that I would have chose any different career path because it's been a very exciting field for me. Great. So, and did you do one internship or two? Was it between your junior and senior year? Yeah, so I was able to do two of them and uh, both of them with uh, Digital Switch okay. and uh, again being able to do those over the summer 
and uh, it was very, very, uh, uh, I guess, interesting in the sense both both internships, I was able to work with a very senior designer and then also able to do some very cool projects over the summer terms. And did the companies come to campus to recruit for the internships? Yeah, they, they did. Um, and again, it was very fortunate that, uh, again, in the Dallas area where I was going to school at the time, UTD, they heavily recruited at least uh, the campus is there. So and it, it happens. I mean, most uh, major employers will go to strategic campuses and they will go and look for internships. Even NXP, where I work at today, will hit on five or six of the major indus uh, universities within Texas as well. Okay. Yeah. So after you graduated, <clears throat> then you got, like, did you have, based on your internships, where you finished up in college, like, you, do you have a master's or bachelor's? So right, right after I graduated, I ended up with the Bachelor's of Science in Electrical Engineering. That's where I came out of school, got my first job, started working for a telecommunications company up in the Dallas area. Uh, after a couple of years there, I felt like, hey, it was really time to go back and pursue my master's. So I started my master's degree. Uh, again, very nice. The company I was working for at the time uh, was paying for your master's program. So I thought, hey, well, why not go ahead and yeah. knock out my master's at the same time? Uh, at the time, I was married, so I was taking a little bit slow, but uh, got it done in about three years. Oh, that's, so. that's a good point. Like a lot of companies will offer funding, right? So maybe yes, work in the masters and later. Yeah, definitely. If the um, company's willing to pay for, you might as well yeah. let them help uh, pay for your education as well. And so your first job out of college uh, was in what field? So I, I took a job for a company, Nortel Networks. Uh, they do telecommunications at the time. Uh, they were really big and at that particular time in the mid-90s entering the wireless uh, realm of communications. Mm -hmm. uh, so I started with them uh, January of 1995 and uh, stayed with them for about seven years really just in the wireless communications field. Okay. And what did you do? What was your expectation of when you graduated, I'm going to start working versus what did you actually end up doing every day? Did it work out like that? Did it navigate somewhere else? How did, how did Yeah, I mean, I think I was then? pretty fortunate. I mean, the internships kind of lined up to what I thought I was going into at the time because, of course, my internships were in doing board-level design development for a telecommunications company at that time. So when I jumped over to Nortel, they were just a lot larger of a company, so there was a lot more diverse opportunities to do certain things. And uh, really, they were doing a lot of bleeding edge at the time, 3G-type communications, CDMA, so it's pretty much exciting. It's all old stuff now, of course, looking back 20 years later, but at the time, being able to come straight out of college into a field that was really just booming and really uh, accept, uh, exceptional growth rate at the time, mid-90s through the early 2000s, really where the wireless communications field was just booming like crazy. So I found myself very fortunate to be able to work in that industry at the time. So you were working more with the board level designs? Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, for day-to-day -day type stuff, I was doing uh, board level design, microprocessor design, firmware design, even started tinkering about doing some software development. So uh, where I hadn't done that in my internships, but at my new, my new job, my first job, I was able to actually do some low-level BIOS firmware development, also get in the lab, do some debug, lots of high-end test equipment, uh, just debugging the hardware, things of that nature. So, um, yeah. And what kind of uh, tools would you be using to work? Were you doing actually doing board schematics and like ORCAD or uh, at that level, or was it more firmware? Yeah. Like writing Verilog code or C code? Yeah, so definitely the mainstream tools of the day, even back then and today, is Cadence, and there's also Mentor Write. Both of them have big, huge suites of tools that do both the front end in the sense of the schematic part of it and then also the back end with uh, Allegro for the Cadence-based tools, and then Mentor's got their own uh, base tools as well. But yeah, I mean, those are the general ones. I mean, there's probably half a dozen, close to a dozen different uh, types of tools that are out there, depending on uh, the suite of what you're looking for. But at least the companies I've been with, they've been mainly on the mainstream, either Cadence-based or Mentor-based, in terms of the development tool sets that, that we've utilized, so. And how would you say your board level work, I guess, um, if I was to categorize that versus uh, silicon design or system level work, you know, if you were to contrast that, is, you're obviously working with boards, it's still engineering based. Um, mm -hmm. what, what would some of the job titles be that might relate to that job? 
Yeah, so I mean, uh, in the sense of in the board area, I mean, it, there's different aspects of board level design from a research and development perspective. You got digital designers, you've got FPGA designers, those that are still doing even RTL development, uh, but more or less doing it for boards, board aspect of it. Uh, you've got CAD engineers, the ones that are actually laying out the actual physical boards. Okay. You've got uh, in the area of also test engineering, those guys that are basically taking a product and moving it into production and making sure that it can be fully tested and vetted and have really good high yields as well as it goes into production. Uh, you have manufacturing engineering. These are guys that are basically taking the ideas and, and uh, kitting up the things and making prototypes and helping making sure that the prototypes can come back in house so that the the designers can actually uh, test okay. and troubleshoot them as well. So there are various different aspects, even within the board design development, you have, <clears throat> you know, if I was just to kind of summarize, you have those that do the architecture type work. These are the ones that are creating the concepts and the ideas. You have those that are then taking the architectural ideas and, and actually designing them. So those are the, the developers or the designers. And then you have the CAD engineers that are taking it and actually implementing it onto kind of a circuit board. Uh, and then on the back end, the designers that are developing and, and debugging it, and then the test engineers, and then kind of the manufacturing engineer that's kind of overseeing the whole thing from a program management perspective as well. So, okay. Yeah, that's good. I mean, so you can see just within the field, even in electrical engineering, down to board design, down to all the aspects in board design, there's a lot of different flavors and varieties there to work with. So, yeah. and then... How did um, so that wasn't necessarily a goal. You just wanted you liked the field, got into it, and right. you worked at Nortel for seven years and yeah. worked on the, the board, sure, uh, in the field of the board design, right. And then where did that kind of spawn off into the rest of your career after that? Yeah, so I mean, uh, definitely enjoyed the actual low level hands on. I guess that was one of the key things that I really enjoyed about it was just the hands on aspect of being able to. You know, you design something, you actually get prototype hardware back in the lab, you're able to actually see something you physically created. So that was awesome to do for several years. Uh, but then as I grew in my career path, I really uh, swung more towards the architecture side, also more towards the management side aspect of it. So um, as I left Nortel and uh, headed down to Austin to go work for Motorola at the time, actually went into more of the architecture role, helping to define new products, right? So felt like I had enough experience behind me for those seven years working with Nortel that I could actually help start creating and coming up with new concepts. And so that's what was kind of exciting because now you're really on the forefront of things. Uh, it's hard to jump right into those types of roles right out of college, of course, but you get some experience behind you, you get some uh, you know, uh, technical insights and some of the in industry stuff behind you, then you can start moving into more of the, uh, the concept stuff, and that's kind of what I was doing there for Motorola and was for several still, years. Was this still board-related work? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, somewhat. I mean, I, I transitioned from a telecommunications company to now a semiconductor company, okay. so at least when I brought came on to Motorola at the time, it was more doing uh, engineering and uh, creating products for semiconductors. So okay. for a little while there, I, I sort of jumped directly out of the board level stuff and was helping to do architecture work for semiconductor chips at that point. Okay, so you, you it wasn't a board related transition from job to job. You actually went Correct. and a, kind of picked up a different flavor. Yeah, again, jump, jumped into right. a kind of a different route. Definitely still had the strengths that I had acquired being a board design developer definitely helped from semiconductors because of course semiconductors have to go on boards yeah. and they, there's a, a, a the, the, my background the knowledge I had helped me to be a good architect okay. uh, when I was designing so semiconductor chips and so that's what kind of helped they kind of brought us over because they knew that we were system level people we were designing system we were designing in products and of course semiconductors have to go into those in products so they were looking for people to come and help them design next generation chips Okay. So, and then after you got into the architecture mm -hmm. and kind of how did the career grow after? Yeah, that? so it went on for quite a while. So I did that uh, probably three or four years with Motorola doing the architecture stuff. Again, I really enjoyed that in the sense that it put me in the forefront, actually talking with end customers, uh, understanding what kind of their their challenges were, where they wanted to head, where they wanted their next end systems to be at. So that kept us in the forefront of how we wanted to design our chips. And then that kind of evolved over time that uh, another opportunity within Motorola opened up. They had a board development organization 
Uh, at that time, I wasn't really looking to get back into the low-level board design, but uh, a management position opened up, and I thought, well, that would be kind of cool. I hadn't done management, so I uh, ended up taking that role and jumping in, doing uh, board uh, design management. Uh, had team at that point of about uh, 15 engineers, uh, and then over time, that's grown, so I've got a, a team of about 25 people now that work for me. But uh, yeah, so I, I guess my, my career has kind of grown over time in the sense of low-level board design into an architectural type role, and then that kind of fostered over into a management type role that I've been in for probably the last 15 years now. Okay. So and you said the management was like in oh, the groups you're over, what yes. kind of disciplines do they? So primarily uh, all of those are doing board level design. Okay. So basically the people that, like the, the person I was right out of college doing board level development, schematic design type stuff, those are the people I'm managing right now okay. at this point, so. And so that being said, um, you know, do you, you know, I guess you enjoy what you do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what would you, would you do anything different? Uh, if you looked back, how you approached it, is there anything you would do different for yourself? Or do you feel like everything went smoothly? Yeah, I mean, I definitely enjoyed the path that I was on. I think in hindsight, and of course, I've been in the industry now since 95, so roughly about 25 years. And uh, as I just described, probably three main job descriptions in the sense of designer, architect, and then also into management. So three different fields uh, or different areas. I guess the, the thing I would kind of encourage uh, someone new into the field is, is get your feet wet as much as possible, right? Go experiment, because again, I think the one thing, and I still may do this in my career, is just uh, you know, engineering is such a vital part, even in the marketing role, marketing functions, especially in high-tech industries. A lot of the very good CEOs, very senior management people, all started off in the engineering track and then made their transition over to business. And that's probably one area I haven't really got into a lot, is more on the business side of it and uh, definitely have an interest. So maybe the back half of my career may be something more on the business side yeah. and uh, focus on that part of it. So. And are you saying you might, might would have dabbled in that earlier? I probably would have dabbled it in a little bit earlier in the sense that, uh, you know, I kind of been more on the technical part of it, the R&D part of it for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And I guess in hindsight, uh, I probably would have dabbled more in that. Probably would even got an MBA uh, right after I got my master's, I, I think looking back, I probably would have went ahead and did my master's and then explored the business side even uh, okay. in that in that perspective yeah. too. So, okay. Um, what advice would you have for someone who's that junior or senior? Maybe they've had an internship um, and they're looking to graduate. Um, you know, as far as the job hiring situation. You know, should they take the first thing that comes along? Should they, like, work with, you know, maybe turn down the first one? Or like, how would you? How did that go about? Did you take the first job that came along? Did you kind of know what you wanted and said, "Let me wait"? How did you figure out what you were worth? Like, yeah, it's definitely interesting because, of course, right out of college, it's uh, you, you are eager to get that very first job, of course, yeah. and. Uh, I guess in hindsight, looking back, I probably did take the very first job that was offered to me, but it was a, it was a good job. I was working for a large telecommunications company, and I felt like they understood our worth and uh, hired us on. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I think uh, some some other transitions I had in between my time at Nortel and transitioning into Motorola, there was a period of time where I was actually looking for jobs. So even at that point, I probably went off and interviewed with five or six different companies and had three or four offers that came back. And I, I would definitely say you, you, you would have to know yourself whether you feel like it's a good fit, right? And usually the way I gauge that part is if the chemistry feels right, uh, at least for me, the jobs that I have stepped into, uh, the ones that I've been happy with, I just knew from the moment when the whole interview was going, something was just clicking. You could just sense that, the vibes. So I, I would tell the person that's looking to trust your instincts, right? Definitely trust your gut, trust your instincts. Uh, don't second guess, because that's very easy to do a lot of times, especially as a, as a new person jumping into a new, uh, new, new job. Uh, but just follow your instincts and your gut, and I think that works well in a lot of ways. Oh, that's so. good. Thanks for, thanks for sharing. Sure. And do you have any recommended uh, books, um, things like TED Talks or blogs or anything? Yeah. Uh, forums people could get on as 
in your case, it would be young engineers you were pointing yeah. people to. Yeah. Uh, anything that you keep up with that you would recommend? Well, definitely uh, early on in my career, definitely immerse myself, especially since I was in the wireless part, telecommunications, I immerse myself in a lot of articles at the time. So I would say probably as a new person coming in, you know, engineering's wide open. Uh, EE Times is a very popular uh, forum out there, of course, uh, to get a broad spectrum of different things that are happening. Uh, you know, for me, my day-to-day -day activities, I like to read a lot of the stuff in the financial side of what's happening in the industry. So I guess my, shi my, my shift has been more from the R&D perspective. Now I'm shifting over more on kind of understanding where the industry is headed as a whole. And uh, so Wired Magazine or Wired uh, on, the, uh, on the internet, very interesting, covers a lot of variety of topics as well, kind of where technology is today, where technology is headed, a lot of good articles there as well. Um, but yeah, there's a variety of different things on the engineering forums, but uh, definitely read Wired, do the inter uh, EE Times, and then I find myself just looking through a lot of financial uh, sections of newspapers, New York Times, Washington Post, things like that, just kind of understanding where the high-tech stuff's headed and stuff like that. So, What's your thoughts on uh, bachelors and just getting them into the industry versus, <coughs> in your case, you waited a couple years and got a master's and your company helped actually right. sponsor it, Yeah, yeah. and versus just getting a master's, um, you know, would you recommend a master's is always good to at least go ahead and go for that level if you have the chance? Um, is it PhD even more so, or is there a sweet spot in there that you feel? Yeah, I mean, and again, it, I don't know. I mean, even in the industry that I'm in right now, I mean, we hire a lot of people just with bachelors, right? And that's the nice thing still about engineering is that there's such a huge demand even still today for engineering that, uh, you know, a lot of folks, even when the market's somewhat soft, and the market's really good actually right now at this particular juncture, um, but yeah, being able to hire engineers with a bachelor's is, is a tremendous asset, right? And I really don't see, at least my experience, there's not a drastic, there is a pay difference between a master's and a PhD, but if you had the opportunity, now granted, granted if your life is in a place where you can go ahead and knock out your master's and PhD, go for it. I know, I know people have done that track. That track wasn't for me. I, I couldn't do it. I was married at the time. I had to do the master's and never really did a PhD, but uh, felt like, you know, overall my career has not been hindered because of that. Been able to uh, grow quite well in, in, in my field, so. Would, would you, and this may be kind of hard to answer, but 15 years down the road, would, would you think that having the masters got you somewhere quicker or not having it would have been a roadblock to any of the positions you've been through along the way or where you're at right now? Uh, well, no, I'm, I think for most part, I, it definitely helped in my overall just cultivating my thought of where I wanted to be because, again, when I went and got my master's, I actually went and specialized in wireless communications at the time, okay. uh, where in my bachelor's, it was just more of a, a general bachelor's of science and electrical engineering. wasn't really specializing in anything, but uh, I had been working for a telecommunications company in the wireless industry, knew I kind of wanted to stay in that sector, and that, that master's self helped solidify that in my mind. What was ironic is shortly after getting it, I ended up moving to a semiconductor company. But the, the, the nice thing about that is over the course of my career, everything that I've touched has been doing wireless chip design, wireless boards for that. So it's all kind of played together. So in, in a sense, it's helped in just uh, having that extra background, those extra years of coursework, industry exposure, uh, definitely was fruitful. Uh, but again, being able to stay in school for six, seven, eight years is not always for everybody's yeah. uh, you know, capabilities. So but for you, it helped more from just an exposure, not a credential. Correct. Yeah, correct. I don't level. feel like my career has been hindered just because, you know, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So as we wrap up, is there anything you would like to highlight in your career where there was, uh, you know, just something that really sticks out in your mind that was a, a great moment that you just felt everything was clicking, you were on top of your game, you know, you were really proud of that moment in time. And on the flip side, is there any catastrophes you would like to share that shows nothing is always perfect and we all make mistakes? Yeah. Um, I, I think that's important. I've learned the most from my mistakes along the way. And uh, so I do like to look at mistakes and hear from other people too and, and learn from other mistakes before I make them. Um, yeah. So if you'd maybe share a couple of those if anything comes to mind. 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, when I look back over my course of my career, again, 25 years in the industry now, one of the key highlights for me was that very first time I got my patent, the very first patent I got, uh, working, uh, doing some innovation stuff for a semiconductor chip uh, for one of our next generation chips. So me and another guy, a couple other guys were collaborating, came up with some ideas. And those are the fun things because, again, that's where you kind of know that you've been in the industry long enough because you have that confidence to know, hey, this is a brand new idea that no one's actually ever thought of or created. And uh, you have enough boldness at that point. And I think it was probably seven or eight years of my career at the time uh, where, you know, because you have to go sit in front of patent lawyers and all these things and they're going to question you to death and all this stuff. But uh, being able to, to get through those sessions, it was probably over the course of two weeks, filing, out, filing the patent application the, and all that, getting it uh, submitted. Uh, and just breathing the sigh of relief at the end of that. But, you know, we didn't actually get the official grant for two years, right? We didn't actually get the, the notification from the patent office that they finally approved it for two years. But when we got that and I got the very first plaque and the, the little ID that said that, that was a very exciting moment. Because at that point, I almost kind of felt like I arrived as an engineer because that sort of solidifies, hey, you created something that no one had done before. And so that was a great thing. On the flip side of things, I would just encourage all engineers uh, like Chris said here, uh, you know, learn from your mistakes because I guarantee you, you will have lots of mistakes early on in your career. And, and don't see those as disadvantages, but see those as advantages that's going to help you grow further and further down your, your career path. I remember making several just very dumb, very basic mistakes my very first, second year, costing the company really $50,000, $60,000 at the time. And the, thinking back, thinking, why didn't they fire me? But all the engineers that were around me were like, don't worry, we've done that ourselves. We, we, we've blown it here, we've blown it there. And you just think about all the very creative event, uh, you know, inventors throughout history. They had to make lots and lots of mistakes before they had successes. And uh, I was reminded of that this past week. I've got an intern that, uh, has, uh, that we had last year and we brought him on as a new grad and we turned him loose on a couple of projects and really just made a lot of just silly mistakes. But then I could see myself saying, hey, remember 25 years ago, you made those same silly mistakes, right? And his projects didn't cost nearly as much as what mine did. I mean, uh, he was $20,000 in scrapping materials and stuff just because he made some simple mistakes. And I look back and think, okay, are you learning from it? He says, yes, I definitely learned my lesson. So for all those young engineers out there, just know that your mistakes are going to help you grow quicker, learn from them. Uh, don't make the same ones over, of course, because that will get you in trouble. But if you learn from them, you grow from them, they're going to uh, further your career faster than anything. So. All right. Well, that's good. All right. Good advice. Appreciate your time. Thanks for sharing with us. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate the time. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you all.